what's up family and welcome back to the channel today we are going to be having a very interesting conversation as a matter of fact i don't even know what i'm going to name it yet i don't know which series this one is going in uh but i think it's appropriate for this channel and so the, while we're not going to be talking about religious superstition today I think this is going to get interesting. So before we do, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that alert notification bell. Uh, consider joining our community either through YouTube, uh, through Patreon. And of course, you can find us on Discord. We're hanging out and doing big things. I like that. And also check out our merch. All right. So as I've stated many times on this channel, superstition doesn't just impact our religious ideas. Um, and I, And I do try to um, go, go out of my way a little bit to highlight other areas that we are likely attached to superstitious thinking. Um, I, I know I've highlighted this, uh, some of this when it comes to finances, uh, some of this when it comes to health, uh, some of this when it, when it comes to politics, and even some of this when it comes to history. Um, and I do, exp I do plan on doing much more of this. Uh, but, the truth of the matter is we take mental shortcuts wherever they are socially acceptable. Uh, for this reason, over the past 10 years, over the past decade, I've become increasingly skeptical of popular narratives that have been sensationalized, but not substantiated. Today, we're going to unpack one of these popular narratives that stems from an unverified quote. It's one that I've heard uh, quite frequently throughout my life. Um, and one that I've even used, especially um, probably not too long, about eight, nine, ten years ago. It was a quote that was near and dear to my mind. And that was around the same time where I started thinking about it and saying, hmm, something about this just doesn't seem quite right. So the quote is from Harriet Tubman, or it's been attributed to Harriet Tubman. And that is, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more. If only they knew they were slaves. I'm going to highlight three, uh, three problems uh, around this quote um, while giving a little more context as we go. Uh, I'll start with the most obvious one, and that is it is wildly inaccurate. <laughs> it's inaccurate. It's, it, it's, you know, it's inaccurate. Um, this quote, often attributed to Harriet Tubman, uh, is not only unverified, but also significantly exaggerates her direct contributions. And I don't say that to take away from her contributions. I say this uh, because I'm obviously a fan of Harriet Tubman's work. Um, but I say this so that we can talk about what's wrong with this type of with these type of things. Uh, historical records indicate that Tubman was directly involved in the liberation of approximately 70 family members. Um, and friends through the Underground Railroad. She also provided guidance to roughly the same number of individuals on how to escape, uh, underscoring her role as both a direct and indirect facilitator uh, of freedom. So uh, in that case, at most, we have approximately 140, maybe upwards of 160 people. That is a long way um, from from thousand, you know, from a thousand of slaves. Um, and, and again, I don't say this to take away from Harriet, but I want to, you know, because even some of you are probably already having a knee jerk reaction already. Like, why are you saying this? And those are the things that we have to be mindful of, uh, because at that moment, then you already know you're giving yourself over to confirmation bias. You're giving yourself because what you're saying is you're saying something that 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 even if it's true, I don't want to hear, <laughs> you know. Um, which I, I'm just interested in true things. But and again, so this it, and this doesn't take away from anything that Harriet Tubman did, because those 140 people who inevitably found their way to freedom, they still found their way to freedom because of her work, you know, and that's worth something. Um, I don't think we sh we have to exaggerate things to appreciate things. Um, that was one of my one of my deconstruction logs, if you will, is discovering when I was a young preacher that. The Bible, the, the, the Bible doesn't actually say that Moses split the Red Sea. It says Sea of Reeds, which is a much smaller body of water, which wouldn't even need splitting. Um, I, I became at that moment disillusioned with Christianity as an industry, 
which is a little different, right? Uh, so it wasn't just disillusion with, with, with the preachers and disillusion with the believers or even disillusion with God. It was like, if this industry is ethical, this wouldn't, these books wouldn't still read like this, you know? And so, and that industry is ultimately led by the, it's not led by the layman, you know? So anyway, but yeah, so it's, 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 it's an accurate, uh, emphasizing the factual number is crucial, not only for historical accuracy, um, but also for honoring the true nature and scope of, Tut, uh, of Harriet Tubman's efforts. Exaggerating her achievements can overshadow the collective efforts of many others involved in the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad. Now, I do my best not to uh, do uh, make the mistake of equating correlation with causation, but sometimes I do wonder if if the exaggerations of Harriet Tubman's work was purposeful to overshadow some other things that were happening, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, so not only is it inaccurate, though, it's also inauthentic, you know, and there's a theme here. Uh, there is no evidence that Harriet Tubman ever said these words. And what's what's crazy about this is that they're, they're literally people who sell stickers and shirts and bumpers and all that stuff with Harriet Tubman's face on it and this quote. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So. There is a correlation between the exaggerations of uh, Harriet Tubman's work and de a decrease in the amount of people who know that the majority of runaways had a history of fleeing South and West into native territory. Today, when most people think about the Underground Railroad, they think about people running to places like, uh, trying to get to places like uh, Maryland, uh, Philadelphia, or Canada, depending on which timeline of period you're studying the runaways. But for the vast majority of the time and for the vast majority of runaways, the preferred destination was south and sometimes west. Um, territories that became known as settlements like Rosewood, Rosewood, Florida, you familiar with Rosewood, were part of a broader landscape that included what are now the Carolinas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. Uh, these areas served as refuges long before they were engulfed by expanding U.S. territories. And so, and the, the thing about this, this research isn't hard to find, nor is it, nor is it hard to verify. Um, there are plenty of stories uh, of how many people ran south. Not only are there plenty of stories, there are plenty of communities um, that, have that are still in existence to this day that preserve the history um, of those uh, Africans who left slavery and, 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 um, and ultimately determined th themselves to be free. Um, you find this in Mexico and Florida and Alabama and Georgia. And man, there's so much nuance to this to this conversation. Um, but we, but when we often think about American history, we forget that it wasn't <laughs> we, we forget that that the that the continent that we're on became a battleground and that this battleground had a very specific timeline and that uh, every time major changes happen on that timeline, it shifted the way we should look at those things. But typically when we think of U.S. history, we imagine the whole United States instead of remembering that, no, the United States started like this and then expanded. Uh, and then even that expansion wasn't overnight. In that expansion, they had to deal with other forces such as the French uh, as well as uh, the, the Spanish. Um, and, and of course, you have some of these groups who left before the United States became uh, a nation. And when they left, they also left behind others, uh, others. And when we're talking about those others. Some of those others, yes, are French and Spanish, but also some of those others are there uh, were, were African uh, helpers, servants and slaves who they could not afford to take with them, you know. Um, so there, there are some things along there. And we're going to we're going to go into that that a little deeper because these these are nuances and it's just all from this quote um i i don't want to deviate um uh, from the topic too much but have you ever wondered why more than 75 percent of european expeditions to the new world required african navigators and translators at a time when the european world had unanimously decided that africans were savages yeah 
Um, you ever wondered why it is that immediately after landing on the coast of Africa, European parties started learning about a mysterious new world? Now, while I'm not suggesting that Africans knew this and no one else did, I am suggesting that Europeans were late to the party and likely found out about this new world through the Africans. And um, I'm saying likely, but this isn't contested. The, the, the information is there. The only place this is contested is in, inside of popular uh, conversations. But if like, I don't know why, like sometimes I, I do find it, uh, I know people say, oh, everything is behind paywalls. Everything is behind paywalls. Not everything. And I mean, just anytime, anytime, anytime somebody leads a conversation with everything, then you already know they're exaggerating. It's hyperbole. But like there, there is there are boatloads of information uh, that you can find out here. But the problem is, is we are so we are so accustomed to just believing what is. And then we have the nerve to look at believers and say, oh, look at them being irresponsible or look at them not being realistic. And the thing is, it's the pot calling the kettle black. This has been a major part of my message since I started uh, sharing information on, on, on my channel is that religions didn't make us superstitious we we were superstitious and we've made our religion and we injected those superstitions into our religions in the same way we have injected those superstitions into our politics in the same way we have injected those superstitions into our history and so the only way that we can actually counteract that is to make the decision to be more responsible with the information that we receive and that means being that means holding ourselves accountable to and all of our getting get understanding. I don't. I don't just want a new phrase to adopt. I don't. I don't just want a new narrative. I mean, in in, in a very real way, we live like robots when we kind of default to this, and not even like robots because we're not even processing the information. It's just like someone just said something. It's popular enough, so now I believe it. It's insane. But yeah, so no, um, it is it is highly likely that that the Europeans found out about uh, the, the new new landmass through the Africans. Um, Asians had known about the New World nearly uh, as far back as at least sixteen thousand years ago. Uh, Polynesians have known about it for a very long time as well, which is evidenced by cross pollinated yam species. Hell, even the Russians knew about it and had you know and had made the uh, had made the long truck trek of investigation. Um, and, and so the, the reason I took that little rabbit trail there is to say that many of the Africans who were present during the years of 14, 1400s up into the 1700s felt absolutely more comfortable running into the new world because for them it wasn't a new world. This is why many of them were used as navigators in the first place. This is why many of them were used as translators in the first place. And I, and I do have to wonder sometimes if, if the narrative around Harriet Tubman, while not saying she didn't do what she did, because I, at this moment, I have no reason to think that she didn't. But I do wonder if, if this country would have had an agenda to promote this particular narrative to continue this idea of the great white savior. Because in that way, when you look at it, it's, it's always black people running from the bad white people to the good white people. And that's what freedom is defined as when you put it in that narrative. When you put it in that narrative, black people's only hope of freedom was leaving the bad white people and going to the good white people. You, you, do you see how that could be problematic, especially when you are absolutely ignoring? And of course, you're not ignoring because you didn't know, but you also didn't. You're not verifying. You're not holding yourself accountable to say, is this information substantiated, which there are. Uh, there are a million and one reasons why we tend to take our shortcuts. It's not all just about being lazy. Sometimes it's not. It's about not wanting to be uh, to be to come off as offensive. It's about not wanting to rock the boat. And these are all of the nuances that we have to weigh heavily and carefully to understand how we're going to be able to approach the world around us. So we have to do better with the nuance of language for sure it wasn't a new world to the whole world now if that was the case nobody would have been here <laughs> it was a new world to a handful of european nations that were competing for dominance and many of those africans who were brought over here would have known that uh, especially during the early years those those um 
Yeah, especially during those early years, they would have been likely, and, and I'm saying likely, but the stories are there. Um, they would have been trying to get as close to other natives, and speci- uh, in particularly darker native groups. Um, and th- th- there is a lot of fringe theory there too. So I don't want to stay there too long because just like the people who accept the uh, the narrative that Harriet Tubman freed a thousand people and that the Underground Railroad only went in one direction, <laughs> you know, um, because freedom was only in one direction, you know, just like the people who accept those narratives. There are also other people out here who have already learned how to trust, how to distrust popular narratives, but at the same time have still not learned how to do the work to determine if a narrative is trustworthy or not. And so because of that, there are people who exist on this other side of the spectrum that are, you know, that are being huh, just, you know, manipulated and riled up by groups like the Hebrew Israelites, the Moorish folk, and, and just kind of a lot in the black consciousness community, which is a community that I'm part of. Um, but there is a lot of misinformation out there. And so this is why I like to kind of highlight things like this. All right. So let's kind of move on. So first it's inaccurate. Um, Harriet Tubman did not free a thousand slaves. Second is an an, an authentic, uh, inauthentic (laughs) Harriet Tubman never, never said it, or at least we have no evidence that she said it. And, and if she did say it, that would, if she had said it, that would bring like other issues. Like we know it was just 70 to 140 and you said a thousand then it's just like, oh, so Harriet Tubman is a preacher because that's what preachers do. OK, so but the last one is it's inappropriate. You know, you don't free anyone by convincing them that they are a slave. You do so by reminding them of their human capacity and their right to use it in their best interests. Convincing someone that they are a slave reinforces a slave ideology and a slave mindset a defeatist mentality resulting in a caricature of a person in need of a hero, savior, Moses, or master. Freedom wasn't the destination. It was the determination. It was the decision that was vital to even have the confidence and audacity to leave the plantation in the first place. Only free people run away. Slaves don't run away. We've got to get the language right here. Discussing freedom and slavery requires careful consideration of language. Asserting that that individuals freed slaves, and I don't care if we're talking about Harriet Tubman or Abraham Lincoln, inadvertently reinforces a narrative that overlooks the agency of those who sought freedom. True emancipation involves recognizing and and affirming the inherent capabilities and rights of individuals, rather than casting them as passive recipients of freedom bestowed by others, which again reinforces the need for a savior. The decision to escape from slavery is a profound assertion of freedom and self-determination. Free people uh, run away, not slaves. A person who has accepted the identity of a slave stays there. The people that Harriet helped to free, the people that Harriet helped to learn how to exercise their freedom, the most important message that she gave them is that if you want to, you can leave. You might have to fight. You might even have to risk death. But if you want freedom, freedom is yours the moment you decide that it is. And that has been the decision that every free person who's ever had to make the transition from being identified as anything less than has had to make. That is the determination that they've had to make. That I am free. Whether your law sees me as free, whether your businesses see me as free, whether your guards see me as free, that I am free. And before I ever let you make me anything other than that, you're going to have to kill me. And that's who Harriet Tubman was. That's the type of message that she carried. That's why she carried a gun with her on her missions, because she was a free woman. We paint, we paint the picture as if it was just to protect other people. And that's not necessarily what that was for. 
That was how she protected her own freedom. That was her way of saying that even if you catch me, I'm not going to be like, oh, you got me. I guess I got to go back with you now. No. And I do this video because I'm hoping that many of you are beginning to see that there's been quite a bit of recklessness and irresponsibility when it comes to how black history and black ideology is painted. If you thought this one was good about Harriet, wait till you learn about the truth about Rosa Parks. She's one of my favorite heroes. Like, oh my goodness, Rosa was amazing. But anyway, I don't say any of this to, to in any type of way uh, make myself the harbinger of truth. No, I'm pushing everybody. This is my sincerest desire. Is that like, what's that, what's that old adage? You know, if you want something done right, do it yourself. If you want to know if the information is right, get it yourself. You know, don't even depend on the sources. Get, get as close to the information as you can. You know, even when you're talking to people like myself, who you may love and trust. If you and I were having a conversation, YouTube is not the place to do it. Don't do that. Please don't do that. But if you and I were having a conversation and we had opened each other up like that, where we're like, you know, yeah, we're cool with each other. We talk. Then if I'm sharing you this information like that, then you say, hold on, but how do you know? And it's not. Yeah. So how do you know? How did you get to this conclusion? Take me on that trail with you. This is how we have to investigate our history. This is how we have to investigate our present. This is how we have to interrogate our future with eyes wide open. Not just being tossed to and fro with, you know, by the waves of sensi uh, sen sensationalism. We need to we need to realize that we are many times victims to our emotions. That if something sounds really good, we want to believe it. And so therefore it robs us of practically investigating it. And that's why I presented this in a threefold way. That it wasn't just that she didn't free thousands of people. It wasn't just that she may have never said this at all. It's also the fact that it has allowed us to continue to support and promote an absolutely dehumanizing narrative. That's just like yikes. And this is dehumanizing. And I don't say that just because this quote is dehumanizing. I say that because I've watched people who cling to this quote dehumanize themselves. I've watched people who cling to this quote dehumanize others. Telling others, like, if you knew you was a slave, I could set you free. You know what I mean? I want you to just listen to the asinineness of that, if asinineness is a word. It is now. I said it. But just something to think about, something to chew on. Now I have to figure out what in the world I'm going to name this video. Um, hmm, we'll see. We'll see. But y'all will be seeing it shortly. Thank y'all for hanging out with me. I always appreciate y'all. This this has been a wild, amazing ride. Channel is growing like wildfire, but even better than that, the community is actually growing and we're actually getting community activity. We got game night coming up this week. So if you're not in Discord, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, but anyway, love y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, join or support our community in whatever ways that make sense for you and check out our merch because it's actually pretty dope. All right, until next time, keep rising, stay progressive, and stay beautiful if you can. I'll holla.